the last 50 years has been a Supreme Court that has been very activist on the conservative side. So if we look at some of the things they've done in the campaign finance cases, the court has very aggressively struck down laws enacted by Congress to keep money out of politics or to control its influence. The court has used a very radical view of the First Amendment to strike down those very good laws. Hello, everyone. I'm Mila Atmos, and this is Future Hindsight, a civic engagement podcast. In this episode, we'll be taking a closer look at why the Supreme Court has been conservative since the Nixon years and what that has meant for our society. Our guest is Adam Cohen, the author of Supreme Inequality, the Supreme Court's 50-year battle for a more unjust America. His book shows the history of the rulings on the court that bring us to where we are today and therefore what's possible into our future. We start with a recap of America's most liberal court under the leadership of Chief Justice Warren in the 1960s. It was one that respected workers' rights, it respected welfare, it respected the rights of poor people. That was the Warren Court. And it was doing a lot of incredible things, many of which we all know have entered the popular culture. The Warren Court recognized the Miranda warning, right? The right to be warned that you had the right to remain silent. It was the court that handed down Gideon v. Wainwright, which was the decision that said that if you're poor and you can't afford a lawyer, the state has to appoint one. So that was the Warren Court. And it was consistent with the New Deal, expanding the rights of workers and poor people. And then all of a sudden in 1968, Richard Nixon is elected on a platform of changing the court, making the court more conservative. And in the three years after he's elected, uh, when he takes office, he gets four appointments and he's able to completely change this liberal court into a conservative court. And what's really fascinating is that conservative majority that Richard Nixon built in the late 60s and early 70s is still with us today. We've had that conservative court with a conservative chief justice all the way through. So talk a little bit about how that came about, because it's one of those things where people have a deep misconception that the court is really about meeting out justice. That really isn't the case. And for starters, of course, the justices that get nominated to the Supreme Court are always nominated by a president. And so they are, by definition, partisan. And so how did the Republicans pull this off? Because there was a chance that they couldn't have with uh, what Warren tried to do when Johnson was still president. That's right. I learned in school that the uh, Supreme Court was a sort of temple of justice. And we were inculcated with the idea that the Supreme Court was the institution that looked out for the disadvantaged and make sure that people's rights were respected. When you learn a little bit more deeply about the history of the court, you find out that what was the court doing during the slave era in the United States history? It was siding with the, with the slaveholders. During the segregation era, after the Civil War, when a black man sued and challenged segregated railroad cars in Plessy versus Ferguson, the court sided with the railroad company, not with the black man. In the early 1900s, the progressive era, when Congress was passing laws to protect workers, to outlaw child labor, the Supreme Court sided with the managers and with the companies that were trying to oppress. So that really has been the history. And, you know, the Warren Court that you refer to was a great liberal exception, but it was an exception. It was from 1954 when Earl Warren was appointed to 1969 when he steps down. There was a period when the court was a real champion of the poor and the dispossessed, but that ended and we got the Nixon court. It's important to realize how much of the Supreme Court we've heard of that gets such good PR was an outlier, a real exception to their role in history. So one of the questions that I asked myself the entire time that I was reading your book is, why is the court historically so conservative? Because it seems that it really shouldn't have been this way, but is it that it was set up this way almost in the Constitution, or am I just not understanding it? 
Well, no, it's a great question. And as, as you mentioned in your last question, it is a court that's made up of appointments of the president, starting with Nixon. We have had Republicans in the White House a little bit more than Democrats. So that's one reason we've ended up with a conservative court. But also, in particularly in the last half century, Republicans have been much more strategic about getting the court and holding on to the court. So Nixon went out of his way, took great, great pains to take control of the court. It was a focus of his. He actually drove some of the liberal members off the court. Crucially, a a justice named Abe Fortas, who would have provided the liberal fifth vote in a lot of important cases, Nixon blackmailed and scared him into resigning. So what we get is the conservatives have definitely been more focused on controlling the court. And there are other factors as well. You know, some people would say that the conservative presidents have done a great job of appointing the most conservative justices they can. And the Democratic presidents often appoint more centrist justices. But somehow, other than in the Warren era and a few other exceptional moments, all these things have led us to a court that really is on the side of the people in power. That's uh, totally counterintuitive with the way that we think the Supreme Court should be. Given what you just said, does the constitutional ideal of three branches of government acting as a check on each other actually function? Well, I still believe in it. I think it's important. I think the founders had a great idea there because whenever you have power too concentrated in one person or body, I think it does lead to tyranny. So the idea that you have three independent sources of authority checking and balancing each other, I think is a great one. And we've seen historically, it has done some very important things. During the Watergate crisis, it did take the Supreme Court to step up in a unanimous ruling and say that Nixon had to hand over the White House tapes. And those tapes ended up being so incriminating that they led to Nixon resigning. So having multiple bodies is good. The problem, though, is that the Supreme Court has not lived up to its ideals and the way it's actually functioned has been too much as yet another force for those in power, which Congress and the president so often are as well. Right. I think this is a fundamental misconception that a lot of people have, that the Supreme Court is really not an impartial body, but it's really sort of its own entity that seeks its own power and it exerts it upon the nation. How is it that the Supreme Court has built up its own power over the last 50 years in a way that I think that people don't fully comprehend or don't fully appreciate. You know, the decisions that come out of the Supreme Court are far reaching into our everyday lives. Yeah. And, you know, during the Warren Court, there was a a rap that conservatives gave, which is that it was a court of liberal judicial activism. So they said that decisions like Gideon v. Wainwright recognizing a right to counsel, Miranda recognizing a right to be told that you can remain silent, that that was judicial activism by liberals. And they thought that that was a particularly liberal phenomenon. What we've seen the last 50 years has been a Supreme Court that has been very activist on the conservative side. So if we look at some of the things they've done, in the campaign finance cases, including Citizens United, the court has very aggressively struck down laws enacted by Congress and in some cases state legislatures to keep money out of politics or to control its influence. The court has used a very radical view of the First Amendment to strike down those very good laws. We've seen it in the voting rights context as well. The heart of the Voting Rights Act, Section 5, which requires jurisdictions to pre-clear any changes they make with the Justice Department or with the federal court to make sure that they're not going to hurt minority voters. That very important preclearance requirement, this activist conservative court struck down on very dubious grounds. So what we're seeing now is a court that is very confident in its own position, in its very conservative views, and it's using its power in many cases to run roughshod over the decisions of the Democratic branches. What is the primary mechanism by which a Supreme Court has essentially cemented Republican power more or less for years going forward? So I would say there are two main strands to what this conservative court is doing to support Republican power and conservative power. One is, if you look at their election law cases, it's just striking the degree to which they almost invariably rule in ways that will lead the Republicans to win elections. We saw that famously in Bush versus Gore, where they actually stopped the counting of validly cast votes just to ensure that Bush became president. But we see it in many other cases when they've upheld the very strict voter ID 
ID laws. They've struck down protections for minority voters in the Voting Rights Act. They've refused to step in when there's been egregious partisan gerrymandering that overall very much helps the Republican Party. In decision after decision in election law, it's amazing how many are five to four rulings in which the conservatives take the position that helps the Republicans to literally win elections and stay in office. But the second strand is the court has also really on its own reinforced the goals and the values of the Republican Party. So, you know, one thing that our Republican Party in modern times has stood for is making sure that business and the wealthy do very well and not being very concerned about the poor. You know, the thesis of my book is that income inequality and wealth inequality in our country, which we often attribute to many other things, to globalization, which is taking jobs overseas, to automation, which is replacing people with robots, to decisions made by the president of Congress, like tax cuts. I argue in the book that the Supreme Court's rulings in many areas have been a major driver of that because they've continually ruled against the poor, ruled against welfare rights, given the rich much more power to influence elections with their campaign finance rulings, and on and on and on. So I would say that this court is literally helping Republicans to take office, but also has put together 50 years of rulings that really reinforce Republican policies that help the rich and hurt the poor. That was Adam Cohen, author of Supreme Inequality. When we come back, we'll discuss why conservatives sympathize with the upper class. This message is brought to you from Between Two Mics, the remote recording podcast hosted by Squadcast.fm founders Zach Marino and Rockfelder. If you're wondering what's next in the podcast sphere, tune in as they speak with guests who are pushing the limits of what's possible in podcasting. Learn about podcast ad tech, building community in your listeners, diversity in the audio space, and where the major podcast players like Spotify are headed. If you're a podcaster yourself or just love podcasts, Between Two Mics is for you. Head over to squadcast.fm to learn more. So explain what the purpose of oppressing the poor is for Republicans or for conservatives. Why would they want to do that? Well, you know, these are very deep questions about who has sympathy with the poor and who has more sympathy for those at the top of the hierarchy. Some part of it, I'm, I'm sure, is that Republicans have bought into the mythology of pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And we have to assume that those who are poor on some level deserve to be poor. But also, I just think a lot of the Republicans literally come from the upper class and are sympathetic with it. You know, one of the things I talk about in my book is at the height of the Warren court, it was striking that the five liberal justices who were doing so much of this had themselves grown up poor or on the edge of poverty. So I think a lot of it is also, on some level, really class identification. And what we have on the court right now is, with few exceptions, justices who really were raised in privilege, who went to privileged colleges and law schools, who had privileged careers in the legal profession. And that just ends up being, in most cases, the groups with which their sympathy lies. Yeah, that really struck me also in your book that the people who were most sympathetic are the people who grew up themselves at or near poverty. And it speaks so much about perhaps what kind of justices we need more of in the court. Is there really such a thing as a neutral court? And if so, is that really what we want? Yeah, it's a great question. I don't think anyone is ever truly neutral, but what we are getting now is a much more hyper-partisan court. And the way we can see this is, look at when a new justice is appointed. You know, when President Trump made his appointments, there was no pretense that he was going to look for the best judge or best decisions on the lower court or whatever objective standards you want to come up with. It was always about, we are going to find justices whose ideology we know. And he and Mike Pence went out and talked to conservatives and said, don't you worry, we are vetting these justices to make sure that they are ideologically pure. Now, more than in the past, we have an assumption that a justice is going to act politically. There is a, a growing gap among, quote, liberal policies where even many conservatives, many people who are 
highly aligned with the upper class are more sympathetic these days to things like women's rights, abortion rights, and gay rights, but they're much more skeptical of the rights of the poor. A lot of those conservatives are still just as punitive about poor people, about people on welfare, as they ever are, which is why I made that the main focus of my book, because I really think it's the poor and racial minorities who are not being lifted up, even as some other groups, including women, have in the law in, in recent decades. That's clearly your passion, is the poor. And in fact, it's unquestionable that being poor is punitive. So this is kind of like a two-part question. One part is, after Nixon appointed Berger to take over, there were a handful of decisions that essentially unraveled the war and court decisions very quickly and then basically became a slippery slope. So what are those? And then the second part of that question is, if we are able to install a liberal court, what would be the first few things that need to be decided to reverse this and, let's say, make the poor a special minority group like based on race? Great. OK, so you, you've touched on a lot of really important things. there. So first, there was that moment of inflection, as you say, when the Burger Court takes over. And I embody it most with the two different welfare rights decisions that were decided literally two weeks apart. One ends my first chapter on all the good things the court did for the poor, and one starts my next chapter on all the bad things the new Nixon court started to do to the poor. So at the end of the positive story for the poor, the court decides a case called Goldberg versus Kelly, which was a really uh, remarkable decision that said when localities and states want to cut people off from welfare, they have to give them a hearing first to make sure that they really should be cut off. That gave poor people around the country an enormous right to due process. Two weeks later, though, uh, a poor family in Maryland challenged a really unfair cut in their welfare benefits, which was done by just adopting what they called a family cap. And it said, if you have more than four children, we're only going to give you the amount of money you would get if you had four children. So other children don't get any money at all. There was a very strong equal protection challenge to that. The Supreme Court ruled against the poor family. And then after that began to rule more and more against the poor. But then my next chapter is about what the court did in education law. And that is just so crucial. When the Burger Court takes over, it gets two enormously important education cases. The first one from Texas was a Texas federal court actually ruled that states have to fund rich and poor school districts equally to make sure that school children all around the state have access to the same educational opportunity. That was the ruling in the lower court. The Burger Court reverses that five to four. The next year, there was a really strong decision out of Detroit from a federal court there, which said that since they couldn't integrate the schools in Detroit just by moving around students within the city, because it had become so overwhelmingly black at that point, that they had to have busing across urban suburban lines to ensure that white and black students actually went to school together. That would have been a transformative ruling for the country. The Burger Court overturns that five to four. I think those decisions were incredibly important. So what could we do if the liberals took the court back again? Really undo all of those things. The court was getting close, I believe, to recognizing that poor people are what the law calls a discrete and insular minority, the way racial minorities, religious minorities, and some other groups are. And because of that, the court should give specially tough scrutiny, be more likely to strike down laws that hurt them. That would be a powerful tool if the court said that the poor were a discrete and insular minority. The other two things I would say that would be really important are reversing those two education cases I just mentioned. Imagine if the Supreme Court said the Equal Protection Clause requires equal funding for all school districts in the state. And imagine if they said it requires busing across city suburban lines to make sure that public schools are integrated. And then finally, the most damaging thing I think the court has done has been the campaign finance rulings. And if liberals could just overturn not just Citizens United, but the underlying principle, which was in a much earlier decision from 1976, that money is free speech and say money is not free speech and start upholding the laws that Congress and the states adopt to limit the role of money in elections, that would, I think, have a very large positive impact on American politics.
So, well, how would we get there? Can you do that in a case in one fell swoop? But also you have to wait for a case to come before the court. So how does that actually work? Or do you need Congress to write legislation? Well, the problem is that Congress can't because when Congress does it, the Supreme Court keeps striking it down. The only two options would be the Supreme Court changing its approach or a constitutional amendment, which many Democrats have called for. But those are really, really hard to enact. So what I think we need is first to get a liberal majority back in the court and then break with what is now very well established precedent and say money doesn't equal speech. And I think it would be a process, but if they would start upholding reasonable campaign finance laws and then eventually get to striking down that Buckley principle, that money equals speech, since Congress can't do it, I think we're unlikely to get a constitutional amendment, although it'd be great if we did. It's really just a matter of getting a good liberal court in there and then giving it the time, I hope, to finally do the right thing. What are two things you think an everyday person like me could be doing? Well, honestly, the most important thing is getting the right person in the White House. The reason presidential elections are so important is there's so much power there, so much power in every direction, but that includes to shape the Supreme Court. When that Democrat is in office, hold them accountable, not just to appoint a Democrat, but I would like to see a real progressive voice on the court. Let's make sure that they appoint a few rabble rousers. There have been some amazing justices in the past, like Thurgood Marshall, who was a real voice for the poor on the court, like William O. Douglas, who was pretty much of a radical. Let's get some real loud voices on the left who are as loud as the very conservative voices on the right. Oh, great advice. So I have a question about sort of some of the cases that you spoke about in the book about robbing the rights of poor people and expanding the rights of the rich. And I kind of wanted to go back there because the Supreme Court did two things. It separately robbed the rights of the poor and also expanded the rights of the rich, but it did them in tandem. And so in what way does robbing the rights of the poor actually expand the rights of the rich, even indirectly? I think as the court views it, you know, as conservatives view it, it very often is zero sum in their minds. So like any rights you give to the poor in their mind are being taken away from the rich and from big business. So welfare rights, for example, if we had recognized any kind of a right to real constitutional protection for welfare, we would probably have a more robust welfare system. And as we all know, I mean, the welfare system in the country right now is incredibly deficient, right? People who receive welfare are living well below the poverty line and it's some states, it's become almost impossible to get cash welfare. So imagine if we had a different system where poor people really were taken care of. For some conservatives, they think, well, that's money out of my pocket. You know, That's money that's going to come out of my taxes. And then in the electoral context, for example, I think the conservatives on the court very much feel, well, if we have the Voting Rights Act strictly enforced and more poor and minority voters vote, their candidates are more likely to win. And that means that candidates who support tax cuts for the rich and and the rights of corporations, all that, are, are more likely to lose. So I do think when conservatives look at these things, they do tend to have this feeling that your rights are somehow things taken away from me. How is it that the Supreme Court is so fundamentally undemocratic? And why is it that people don't understand that? Yes. I mean, you know, the powers that be just are very good at getting their way, right? So the Republicans and the special interests, the wealthy interests they represent, have been laser focused on holding the Supreme Court, winning the Supreme Court, and liberals have not been as focused on it. But I don't think it's impossible. I mean, we saw during the Warren era that you could have a very progressive court really standing up for the little guy and the little gal. And I think that's possible again. You know, one thing I tried to do in the book is to show how one man, Nixon, had such a huge impact on the court and left an imprint that's lasted 50 years by his moves. We could have a liberal version of that. If we do the right thing and get a court that we like, we could have a court for a long time too. I think all things are possible in politics. One of the messages of my book is, you see how terribly effective Nixon was? Why don't we be just as effective for our side now? Yeah, I agree with that. Looking into the future, what gives you hope? Well, certainly the recognition we now as a society have for the fundamental inequalities, it's reached new levels, it's having an effect. So I actually think, although this is a very 
troubling time and we've had this terrible disease and we've had the quarantines and we've all been living through a lot. There's also a lot of very good things happening right now. So in fact, for people who care about creating a more equal society, these are, you know, oddly enough, some of the most encouraging times in many years. Well said. Thank you very much for being on Future Hindsight. Oh, thank you. I I really enjoyed it. In the wake of Biden's victory, 43 states have proposed at least 250 voter suppression bills, and some have already passed, like in the state of Georgia. Passing for the People Act in the Senate would remedy both voter suppression efforts and campaign finance laws. However, even if that bill were to pass, a 6-3 conservative Supreme Court will likely strike it down. The good news is that the American Rescue Plan is tackling poverty directly from the ground up. Among many other things, it will deliver a child tax credit that is estimated to reduce childhood poverty in half, provide emergency rental assistance, increase funding for Medicaid, and waive federal income tax on the first $10,200 of unemployment benefits by middle and lower income taxpayers. In addition, the Biden administration is appointing diverse, liberal and competent judges as fast as possible, which will have long lasting effects. Mayor Garland was sworn in as the new attorney general since he was a top Justice Department official during the Oklahoma City bombing trial. He's now well equipped to tackle domestic white terrorism, one of the biggest threats to American democracy. And finally, because Georgia elected two Democrats to the Senate, and Democrats now have a razor-thin majority, if there's any vacancy on the Supreme Court in the next four years, we could see it filled by progressive justice. Next week, I speak with Laura Joyce Davis, the host of the Shelter in Place podcast, which she started at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. Shelter in Place started as this creative endeavor, this kind of time capsule. And very, very quickly, it became the way that my family and I were rewriting life and figuring out what we were going to do with this new reality where just about everything was suddenly very, very uncertain. We talk about what we've both learned through our podcasting journey. And if you want a glimpse of who I am as a person and how podcasting has changed me over the years, this one's for you. Until next time, stay engaged. I'm Mila Atmos. Thank you for continuing to listen to Future Hindsight. Our executive producer is Mila Atmos. The audio producer is Peter Fedak. And our associate producers are Miriam Zumbul and Brooke Sion. Be sure to listen to us on Apple Podcasts, futurehindsight.com, or wherever you enjoy podcasts every week. Mm-hmm.